Wow, Andy, we're almost at capacity. It's like the bandwidth problem. I think that uh, uh, the MIT Forum over the last three years is partly responsible for this bandwidth problem that we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> Let me explain. You've all heard of Pandora. We had Pandora out a couple of years ago. And uh, we, they talked about their business and how they started. Of course, Pandora specializes in streaming music. And at the time, we took a straw poll of the audience and asked how many people stream their music. So I'd like to do the same. How many people here ever stream mu music off the internet? Wow. So almost everybody, I'd say like 90%. Well, just two years ago, it was probably like a third of the audience raised their hand. And that was a Pandora-interested audience. Another topic we looked at two years ago was the growth of social media. Two years ago, 300 million people were on Facebook. Wow. That's the eighth largest country in the world. And what's happened in the last two years? 500 million today. And they're all using the internet. They're all using the same bandwidth, the same pipes, the same systems. And uh, about half of those people are still every day using Facebook. That was about a quarter of the people two years ago. Last year, we had an event on smartphones and the growth of the smartphone industry, and specifically how applications are starting to talk to the physical world around us. And 80% uh, now, 80% growth in smartphone sales year over year from last year. And uh, three years ago, we had an event that featured an individual who was starting a business to stream movies on the internet, independent film. And now we know that it's a pretty common daily practice to use your Apple TV and stream with Netflix and other software solutions. So certainly, there has been an exponential growth in the usage and the devices and the applications running on the networks, the wired and wireless network. Video conferencing, that's something that's become a standard thing now with Skype and Uvu. They are free. I mean, they're free, right? Sort of. And YouTube is the third most popular website in the world. And that's all about video, and that takes some bandwidth. People are now using video uh, conferencing on their phones. And I think a year from now, that may just be the standard way that we make calls, or certainly it's going to grow. So in order to talk about what this usage is doing to bandwidth, we put together tonight's forum, and the bandwidth played on. And we brought in four, panel, four experts in their fields. Um, our keynote speaker is Andrew Siebold, Andy Siebold. And he's truly a world-renowned authority in this industry. Locally, Mr. Siebold is a member of the Board of Directors and VP of External Affairs for the Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club. And nationally, he holds several positions with some government organizations, Vice Chairman of the Associated Public Safety Communications Officials, member of the Public Safety Advisory Committee, uh, he's a member of the Emergency Response Inter Interoperability Center, representing the National Sheriff's Association. He's a consultant to the uh, Public Safety Alliance. And Andy testifies in landmark cases around the world on network policies. And in fact, we were almost lost him for tonight. He told me a couple days ago that he was almost asked to testify in DC. And fortunately, they, uh, they got someone else. But you can find uh, Andy speaking internationally on this topic. And tonight, please join me in welcoming him to Santa Barbara, where he lives. Thank you, sir. Good evening. It's good to be here, especially since I live here. And uh, I like to give back to the community I live in. Um, so while he's getting the slides ready, i talk a little bit about my blog, which is called Tell It Like It Is, and by the end of this, you'll probably understand why. Um, I don't pull any punches. Even my clients know they're not safe if they do something dumb. So I've got a lot to talk about. This is the agenda. We're going to go through it fairly quickly. We've got a great panel afterwards. I'm going to talk a lot about a lot of subjects, and I want to start with the wired internet, kind of give you a status report. Um, this is how many people use the internet worldwide, and this is as of 2010. You can see the numbers are, are pretty high. Um, world internet penetration rate, 77% in North America, uh, and it drops down, of course, uh, in Africa, it's uh, about 
but there's still a lot of penetration around the world in the internet. Now, this is a composite of an organization that runs monitoring on internet traffic. And this slide is four days old. And I want you to notice that we were running at 80% of total network capacity on the internet. Um, and that is because of one thing, streaming video. Over 50% of all of the internet traffic today is video. Google says it's gonna to go to 64% by the year 2012, and that's where we are. Now, I have made statements, let me go back to this for a minute. I have made statements that I'm very concerned about whether we're gonna run out of bandwidth in both wired and wireless internet, and let me explain why in the wired situation. The back-end providers of internet connectivity, most of which are listed here, are not building any more infrastructure. Why? Because it doesn't pay them to do it. They don't make any money. They put fiber in the ground, they put microwave in the air, there's no payback for them. So they're not building any new back end. We need to figure out a way to motivate people to build more back end. And that's our biggest issue. But right now, these companies can no longer make a profit. And um, there are many predictions that the internet traffic will see exceed capacity by 2012 in the United States. So it's a huge issue. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about net neutrality, but net neutrality pushes us over the edge real quick, very quickly. So let's look at speeds that we all use, DSL speeds up to eight megabits today, TV coax bandwidth. There's more bandwidth in a piece of coax cable than we have in all of the wireless infrastructure today that's out there. T1 lines, 1.58 megabits, you can see them, T3, then you get down to fiber. Um, by the way, here's a little quiz. Who owns more unused fiber in this country than any other company? The answer is Google. They have been buying it by the drove. And they have a plan for it. They haven't shared it with me, but they have a plan. <laughs> and we're gonna see that plan. Um, Here's coax, I'm sorry, this is a very unreadable diagram, but it shows you the amount of bandwidth on a single piece of coax. Now, so the wired internet relies on multiple backend providers, and you may not believe this, there are no written agreements in place between these people. There are handshakes agreements about how, how to hand off traffic. So if one day somebody wakes up and says, I'm not doing internet anymore and closes it down, they have no contractual obligation to continue. That's something we should be aware of. Back, uh, as I said, uh, build out has crawled to a slow, uh, to a crawl. Um, we're about 80%, video is 50%. Now, these are three things that I wanna make an important point about. The internet is not a mission critical network. And anybody who treats it like a mission critical network is gonna get burned at some point in their life. And one of the reasons that I have a problem with cloud computing is, if I can't get to the cloud, I can't get to my information. So, I use the cloud to back up my stuff, but everything else is on my desktop or on my iPad or wherever it is. Free for all to use, it's not true. You know, a lot of people say, well, the internet's free. Well, it's free just the way highways are. You pay for gas, you pay taxes. You pay for a car, you pay for registration, you pay for taxes. There are costs involved in getting on the internet. Um, once you get there, there's a lot of free con uh, content. Now, this last point is most important. It is not a managed network. There is nobody sitting in a command center somewhere looking at the amount of internet traffic and routing it. It's a fairly smart network. It was designed to be very smart. But there is no one organization or body that can come in and manage loads and distribute loads. It's free running. So we should keep that in mind. So statistics, we rank five in the Americas in broadband deployment, 74.2%. Um, Look at the growth, 134% growth in one year, 
58% of us have broadband access at home, 9% have broadband access at work, 9% have dial-up, and 21% have no access. And I'm going to talk a lot about the nationwide broadband plan and what we're doing there to get um, internet into rural America. Um, there's two kinds of people who don't have access, people who cannot get it and people who cannot afford it. And there's a big difference. And I'll talk about that in a little while, too. Um, we are 15th in the world in total broadband population by household. And that's not a very good place for us to be. Now, wireless, 96% have access to one or more voice and text networks in the United States today. 90 to 92% have access to broadband wireless services. Now, if you'd listen to President Obama's speech in Michigan last Thursday, he's pledged to get us to 98% broadband penetration using wireless uh, in the next few years. And I'm involved in that project, and I'll talk about it. Today's average speed for wireless broadband is between 1 and 15 megabits down, and I'll talk more about that as I get into it. So let's go into the wireless internet. And there's a difference between the wired internet and the wireless internet. And that's one of the things I hope you get out of this. The subscriber totals uh, are here. I, I figured some of you uh, like graphs, so I put some of these in. Um, a lot of people using wireless. Mobile data as a percentage of revenue, you can see that it's gone up quarter after quarter as more and more people start using wireless data. Percentage of revenue from data, the US is 33.8%. That means that voice accounts for the rest of wireless networks income. And that's important to remember because wireless data consumes 100 times more bandwidth than a single phone call. Yet our data rates are growing very high. Look at Japan, 48.7% um, revenue from data. It's moving in that direction. The US operators, here's how their uh, revenue from data stacks up. And you can see that AT&T and Verizon, about 35% of their revenue is coming from data. Um, Sprint Nextel, about 31.2%. And T-Mobile, 25.6%. Data revenue is growing, voice revenue is declining, that's true. We have the cheapest, by far, voice rates in the world, except for India. India pays less than we do, but we pay an average of five cents a minute. There's one chart I didn't include, but we have a chart for, that we do for our wireless data university, which is an eight hour thing we do several times a year. We have a chart of minutes of use, and the United States leads by a huge margin. In the United States, the average cell phone user talks for 884 minutes a month. The next highest is Canada at 635 minutes a month. That's a lot of talking. OK, so wireless data capacity. How much spectrum do we really have? Spectrum is a finite resource. We can't make any more. We can use what we have more efficiently, but we can't invent more. We can't make more. So let me try to put that in perspective for you. Um, this is the electromagnetic spectrum, and it goes from a low um, below the AM broadcast band up till you start getting into microwave and infrared and then ultraviolet. So all we have is right in here, and we don't have any more. Um, I love this. This is the Federal Communications Commission chart of the available spectrum and who has access to it. And even with the one that's mounted on the wall, you can't read it. So each one of these boxes is a different portion of spectrum and a different slice of users. Now, if you studied this, the one thing that's really interesting is that the NTIA, which is the organization that handles the federal allocation of spectrum, controls 62% of all available spectrum in the United States. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, controls the rest. And if we're gonna get more broadband spectrum, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, we're gonna have to steal some of the federal government spectrum in order to do it. 
and that's going to be contentious. Now, to give you an idea, locally, here is AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, Nextel, and Clearwire, and here's the amount of spectrum they have in each band. There are this many bands um, in your phone today. Most of you have 800, you have 1.9, and if you're on um, clear, you have 2.5, 2.1, uh, or if you're on T-Mobile, and if you're on Clearwire, you have 2.5. Um, so AT&T has an average of 91 megahertz of spectrum, and this is in the top 100 markets. Verizon has 91, T-Mobile only has 54, Sprint Nextel only has 53, but look at this, Clearwire has 150 megahertz. We don't have enough spectrum for our commercial operators. The FCC is trying to get us more, but we're doing pretty well with what we have. So here are the operators in the United States, the number of customers they have, and their relative size, and AT&T and Verizon. If you look at this chart next week, they'll be flipped. Verizon will be one, AT&T will be two. The next week, AT&T will be one, Verizon will be two. Um, Verizon, now that they have the iPhone, is probably going to have a surge, so they're probably going to add a percentage point or more, and then AT&T will figure out um, how to join that. Um, Sprint down here at 17%, T-Mobile at 11.8, Metro PCS, which we now have at 2.9, and Leap at 1.9. Um, if you add all the numbers up, there's 303 million people, 303 million people in this country, and today 287 million of them have cell phones. So. Wireless broadband fax, it is a shared capacity network, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that. And AT&T reported a lot of problems with the iPhone in San Francisco and in New York and Los Angeles. That's because 4% of their users accounted for over 40% of the broadband data traffic. Near as I can figure, these were the iPhone guys who were unemployed with nothing to do, so all they did was watch video. Okay. Um, now, recently the FCC did one of their technical papers, and what they said was that by 2012, the U.S. wireless operators will be short about 95 megahertz of spectrum given broadband demand. By 2015, this shortfall will be over 200 megahertz of spectrum. 40% of consumers now own a smartphone, up from 16% three years ago, and it's growing rapidly. Now, this one ought to set you back a little. People with PC cards in their notebooks use an average of 1.4 gigabytes of data every month. That's huge. It's an unbelievable amount of data. Whoops. Um, AT&T broadband traffic has increased 5,000% in the last three years alone. And Clearwire subscribers cons consume an average of seven gigabytes every month. Mobile data usage is projected, it projected to grow between 25, 25 and 50 at the current level over the next five years. That means an increase every year that more than doubles. And we don't have the spectrum. Here is um, three uh, different companies forecast of internet usage up through 2014. Cisco, of course, saying it's going to grow 50 times. Uh, Yankee Group being the most conservative, say about 24 times. It's still a big, big growth. Cell site growth since 1997. This is important, and I'm going to talk about this some more. We have 245,000 cell sites in the United States today. But look at the growth rate. Whoops, I keep hitting the wrong button. It's all this technology. Um, we were growing cell sites up until the last few years very quickly. And now we're growing them very slowly. Well, why is that? Um, first of all, it's because nobody wants a cell site in their backyard. And it takes a long time to get cell sites approved anywhere. Um, but it's also because we've already got a lot of coverage. And where people are going now is they're going back to build additional cell sites to fill in and to add more capacity. And I'm going to talk about how you get capacity on wireless. Um,
But the bottom line is without more cell sites closer together, there's no additional capacity. That's the bottom line. We need more. Um, and I'm not picking on Santa Barbara, but typical time to get a cell site through in Santa Barbara County or Santa Barbara City is somewhere north of two years. So that means if they find a trouble spot and they identify a site, by the time they've finished all their work and the city or the county's finished all their work and then they've built the site, you're looking at two years or more to get that site into operation. So if you have a dead spot, it's not going to get fixed overnight. It can't. All right, so let's talk about bandwidth. Bandwidth is shared. These, this is three cell sites. Each cell site is divided into three sectors. And each sector has exactly the same amount of bandwidth. So in this case, I picked five, five megabits of total capacity. Now, if you're the only user in this cell sector, which is 120 degrees, and generally is somewhere around a mile and a half to two miles out, you get all five megabits. But if there are 20 of you in that same cell sector, you're going to share that bandwidth depending on what you're doing. If you're all just surfing the web and you're doing email and everything else, nobody's going to have a problem and you're all going to get along just fine. Now, um, if, however, 10 of you are streaming video, the rest of the people in that cell sector start looking at their uh, broadband connection and it starts getting really, really slow. If you have a cable modem at home, you might have experienced this. I have a cable modem at home and I can tell when the kids get out of school because I have about a 20 megabit connection down and about five megs up until 3.05 in the afternoon. And then it goes down to 12 megabits and three megabits. And that's because coax, modems are shared networks in a cluster of houses. So the more people who are on it, the more people who are sharing the bandwidth. Same thing with wireless. You're sharing this bandwidth here. Um, now, let's look at how we get more capacity. I've already told you there's no more spectrum. We can't invent more. So you can use more spectrum per cell sector, but the carriers have to have the spectrum first and they don't have it. They're using it all. You can build more cell sites closer together, and as I told you, that takes somewhere between 6 to 36 months. Um, all of us in Santa Barbara are really spoiled because it's hard to find cell sites. If you want to see really bad planning, you go, when you drive up I-75 from Cincinnati to Dayton, Ohio, you go over this hill like this, and as you come down into the valley that's Dayton, Ohio, I've stopped there. You can count 37 200-foot tall towers spread out all over the place. That's the way they do cell sites. And it takes about six months. Ours take longer because you don't see them. They're all around us and you don't see them. They've done a good job. But we have more cell sites built closer together. By the way, an average full cell site costs a quarter of a million dollars. And for any of you who want to lease space to a carrier, the going rate per month is $1,500 to $2,500 per month that they pay you. So it's, uh, it can be fairly lucrative. Um, now, what they're doing is they're offloading the larger cell sites, and here's where it gets fun, because now we have microcells, picocells, femtocells, and Wi-Fi. So a picocell or a microcell is a smaller cell. Uh, a picocell is smaller yet. Um, if you want to see what I'm talking about, if you go to Cliff and Las Positas, that intersection, and you look up at the telephone poles, you'll see antennas up there. There's a T-Mobile Pico cell there, there's a Sprint Pico cell there, and there's an AT&T Pico cell there. And then if you look up the hill into Ealings Park, you'll see six antennas, which is an AT&T or a Verizon full-on cell site and an Nextel full-on cell site. So you can get the idea of the difference. Now, femto cells are the new big thing. And the carriers love this. So let me tell you the business model. A femto cell is like having a Wi-Fi access point in your home. It brings the cellular network into your house. So you buy the femto cell. You connect it to your back end, your DSL, your cable. 
it goes over and it gets integrated with their network. So for the privilege of getting off their network and having that capability, you pay for the back end service and you pay for the femtocell. And by the way, they still charge you by the minute. Okay, it's a pretty good deal for them. But what it does is it offloads the big towers and you get better coverage at home. And it works very well. Now what T-Mobile has done is instead of using femto cells, they use Wi-Fi. So for an example, I have a Blackberry here that is on T-Mobile and it has Wi-Fi. And my office and my home are about 150 feet apart and I have access points in both places. So I can start a conversation in my home, it's on Wi-Fi. I walk out the driveway, it switches to T-Mobile, never miss a syllable, go into my office, and all of a sudden I'm back on Wi-Fi. Never miss a beat. Same thing with data. They've done an extraordinarily good job. So a lot of companies are looking at femto cells and Wi-Fi, and it gets us better coverage indoors because we're not going to get good coverage indoors from external cell sites. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things going on. So the network operators are using all three of these, um, but most of them don't have the extra spectrum to deploy. Um, now, I use the word backhaul, that's a funny word, but remember I showed we have a tower that has three segments of five megabits each, so I've got 15 megabits of data. I gotta carry that data back to the network and then onto the internet, and that's backhaul. And typically, in 2G and 3G systems, it's done with a lot of phone lines. When we go to the next generation technology, because it's so much faster, it has to be either fiber or microwave. So it adds to the cost dramatically. Um, so the cell sites need backhaul. Here's some pictures of typical cell sites. But we need to be able to get the information to and from the cell sites. Um, backhaul capacity. Now, this is something we did. And, and I won't identify the coffee shop because they're all the same. But six of us went up to a coffee shop that has Wi-Fi. And this is very, very much like a cell site. And it proves the same thing. Well, Wi-Fi is 50 megabits of data. So you say, wow, there's 50 megabits of data in that uh, coffee shop, except their backhaul is a T1, which is 1.54 megabits. Guess what? The total available bandwidth in that coffee shop is 1.54 megabits, not 50. So we went up there and bought our lattes, and we sat down and six of us started doing internet traffic. And what happened was I had one person start streaming, then the second one, and then the second one, the next one. And by the time we got three of the six streaming video, we had brought that network totally down. So nobody could use it. They politely asked us to leave. <laughs> um, so the amount of bandwidth is a factor of total capacity of cell sector and the backhaul from the cell site. Backhaul capacity, here's the numbers again. The more backhaul capacity you have, the better you are. So let's talk about this next new exciting thing, 4G, long-term evolution, WiMAX. We keep getting faster and faster and faster. Verizon is rolling out LTE uh, all over the United States as fast as they can, and AT&T is not far behind. Well, what is LTE? I'm going to show you some data speeds, um, but I want to just give you a caveat that data speeds depend on the amount of spectrum you have and the amount of spectrum you can utilize. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. The slides will be available if anybody's um, interested. Um, the other thing that you have to note about a cell sector is the closer you are to the center of the cell, the more bandwidth you get. If you're at the edge of a cell sector, you're getting very, very low bandwidth, very low capacity, very low data speeds. You're in the middle, you're getting about 50, 60 percent of it, and if you're up close, you're getting all of it, because that's the way radio signals work. Um, so here's some eye charts from um, Qualcomm, and they tell you that LTE will be somewhere between 73 and 150 megabits. That's in a lab in ideal conditions. What Verizon's network is proving is that LTE in a given network will provide 
somewhere between 5 and 12 megabits down and 2 and 5 megabits up. And that's what you can expect. And again, it's a shared network. But people are making lots of big claims about what the speeds are. And these are very theoretical speeds, and they don't exist in the real world. So here are the deployments in the United States. Verizon has already got now, I think, 39 cities. They're going to cover 95% of the POPs. And a POP is all of us. We're each a member of the population. So that's what that word means. But when the federal government auctions off spectrum, they sell it by megahertz by pop. So when you see that somebody paid 73 cents per pop, that means that they paid 73% for every megahertz they bought per population. at and is about a year behind. NTT Docomo in Japan, KDDI and SoftBank are rolling out. In Europe, there's a lot of them. And in China, there are some more. So LTE is going to become a world standard, there's no doubt. It's not going to be like, I can't take my iPhone from um, AT&T and move it to Verizon because it's a different technology. It's all LTE. Well, guess what? It isn't going to be that way. LTE is, in fact, a common standard. But in the world, it's going to operate on 14 different portions of spectrum. And you can't fit that many radios in a cell phone. They're good. WiMAX and LTE are both the same. I think we're going to end up with one standard. Um, most LTE devices, the LTE devices I have, will fall back to 3G and 2G when you're not in 4G and area. And you'll notice the difference. Sprint and Clearwire, if they live, um, may convert to LTE in the future. Um, my personal opinion is, and somebody was asking me for a stock tip, this isn't one of them. Um, <laughs> I think they're going to run out of money. Um, so the capacity of LTE systems depend on the amount of spectrum available in a given area. Verizon bought 20 megahertz of spectrum, ocean to ocean, Mexico to Canada. They own it all. And they're building very aggressively. AT&T bought a lot of spectrum, um, but they don't have as much. Um, LTE in the United States, it's a, it's a worldwide standard. Um, they're starting to run voice on it, but it is basically a broadband technology. The, way it, the reason it differs from what we're using today is what we are using today was developed with voice and they added data. LTE was designed for data from day one, and it was optimized for data, and it's all the magic word IP from end to end. So that makes things easier. Um, so we have cell site to network backhaul. We talked about that. So let's talk about network designs a little bit, because that plays into this. Um, for those of you who like um, schematics and stuff, I put these up. So here's a typical second generation network with switches and all kinds of things. Fairly simple. Then we went to 3G, and we left the voice on circuit switch, and we went to packet switch for 3G. Now, everybody says, well, IP is simple. It's just routers. It's going to be really simple. So I want to give you the diagram of the next generation wireless network. It ain't simple. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts here. Anyhow, so let's look at the future of cell sites. Um, let's look at Santa Barbara specifically. We have AT&T. We have Nextel. We have Sprint. We have T-Mobile. We have Verizon. We have Metro PCS. In the next five years, Clearwire, maybe. AT&T will be rolling out 4G. Verizon will be rolling out 4G. Cox Communications will be running their own system because they bought Spectrum. There's some unlicensed Spectrum that's coming out available that will be available. And the FCC has four blocks of Spectrum in Santa Barbara that nobody bought at auction. So there's a potential for a lot of carriers. Now, I have to tell you, that if we have all these, three years later, we'll have half of them because they can't all survive. But this is free enterprise, and everybody's going after the gold rush. So here's a typical network today in Santa Barbara with approximate cell sites. You'll notice that Montecito's missing. They don't want any cell sites up there. Um, even after the fires, we thought we could put cell sites up there. But so this is about typical today. Now, what's going to happen 
to get more capacity in Santa Barbara is we're going to, as I said, overload, overlay, and here's what you're going to see, cells within cells. We have to do this. And by the way, I put cells in Montecito because I think we're finally going to get there. Metro PCS is already there with their fiber run stuff. But this is going to be a challenge for everybody in the city and the county because we're talking in the next five years of tripling the number of cell sites we have in the city. Somehow. Tripling. <laughs> okay, so let's t talk about managing bandwidth. Um, and I said I was going to talk about net neutrality. The problem with net neutrality is you can't manage a network. The reason wireless networks work today is that there is a national, national operations center. And in each network, they're looking at each cell site and they're looking at the flow of traffic. So for example, they do smart things. In New York City, when the theaters let out and they all let out at once, they electronically adjust the antennas on the cell sites so that more cell sites cover that area so they don't run out of bandwidth. So they manage the network. Now, you may have noticed that most of the network operators are doing away with all-you-can-eat fixed data pricing. That's another way to manage the network. They have to do that because if they keep offering unlimited bandwidth, they're not going to be able to serve all of us. So just the way we pay for different DSL speeds, different cable speeds, we're going to have to pay for different data speeds. Now, the other thing that's going to happen, which is very interesting, is we're going to be charged by access speed, by data usage, and time of day. And by time of day, meaning if you want to download a movie at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to pay an extra 5 bucks for it. But if you defer it till 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to get it for free. So they're going to use all these tools to help us manage the bandwidth we have. Um, now, the other thing that's happening is we're getting all these new appliances that are wireless. You know, I used to kid three years ago about a GPS radio collar for my dogs. I can't kid anymore because they're on the market. The only thing I haven't figured out is when you tell your dog to come home, can it just ignore you? <laughs> but anyhow, so we have the Kindle, we have the Chumby clock radio, um, we have the navigation systems in cars. At CES this year, almost any kind of device that we use has some kind of wireless in it today, and they're getting to be more and more. So U.S. penetration is at 87% of the U.S. population today. The network operators are not worried at all, because guess what? That's going to go to 300%. We're all going to carry multiple devices. I have more than most, and I'm fortunate because I don't pay for any of mine. But I have an iPad. I have two or three Blackberries. Oh, that reminds me. I have a, another question here. Does anybody recognize that? That is the very first BlackBerry ever made. And it was made in 1998, and it operated on a data network called the RAM Mobile Data Network. And the data throughput was four kilobits per second. And guess what? My first quote about this device was, I get email on it faster than I can read it. You know, I mean, this is where we came from in 1998. So. But you're going to have, look at all this, wireless phones, notebooks, tablets, navigation systems, wirelessly enabled GPS devices, game consoles, mobile TV, wireless GPS, phone trackers, dog collars, and any other kind of device you can imagine. Because wireless chips are easy now. You just buy them and you stick them in the device and you give it to people. And it adds things. So we're going to change all this with our pricing model. One of the things that I'm pushing and I think is going to happen is one person pricing or one family pricing where you buy a subscription and you can use multiple devices without having to have different subscriptions. They don't expect you to use them all at once or to hand them out to your friends. So, but you don't have to have a different subscription for each product you use. Wireless growth. So we talked about that. Canada, 72%. 5 billion wireless devices in use worldwide. Um, 
the numbers are staggering. Many carry more than one device today already. Um, many new devices will include access to satellite services um, when you're out of terrestrial network coverage. Um, Dennis, here's another one not to buy. Um, there's a company called Light Squared, which is doing a satellite terrestrial uh, 4G network. Um, they're never going to make it. They're a reseller, a wholesaler, and there's not enough money for them to do it. So the wireless internet, smarter internet, what I'm saying, and I won't spend a lot of time here, um, is that we need to get away from what we're doing on the internet now. We have to have smart devices, smarter networks, and we need to figure out how not to use so many browsers and not to use so much data. So I have an example of some of the stuff that's happening. Um, you receive a message on your wireless phone from your bank. A $2,500 charge has been made to your credit card, so you know your spouse has been out shopping. Um, you know, we're doing a lot with turn-by-turn -turn navigation. We're monitoring in Montreal now, we're monitoring every cell phone in the network and reporting real time on traffic on all the streets, not just the major highways. Um, but here, what, what I'm looking at is your calendar shows an appointment out of the office. So a must leave by time appears, driving directions are automatically downloaded and available, and it goes back and it looks at the traffic patterns. And if you have to leave earlier because of an accident, it notifies you. Um, so there's a lot of these different things that you can do. So the bottom line here is smart applications, no browsers. I think browsers should be a last resort on wireless devices anyhow. Um, we're starting to see them, WorldMate Live, E-Trade Mobile. There's a lot of things that are getting smarter. Um, lots of different devices. Mobile internet devices I don't think are going to fare well. I think the tablet is the new big thing. When I was at CES in January, there were 55 tablets on the show floor. And there were another 56 e-readers. Now, they're not all going to be around. At the end of this year, we're going to be down to eight or nine tablets and eight or nine e-book readers. But this is one of the gold rush things. You know, I never understood why venture people put money in things without using it in a spreadsheet, but they do. Um, okay, so important issues for 2010. Um, the FCC is trying to reclassify broadband as a telecommunication service. Why? So they can have more control over it. That's not a good thing. Net neutrality, I'm an anti-net neutrality as they get because net neutrality says I can't manage my own network and if I can't manage my network, then some of my customers don't get service. So I'm not a believer. Um, how will broadband pricing change this year? Pricing models, I think, are going to, by the end of the year, one subscription per person, um, and we know what the real data speeds are. Now, having said all that, and not trying to run too long here, the National Broadband Plan was introduced to Congress in March of last year, and the FCC said, um, 100 megabit service for 100 million people by 2020, and it calls, more importantly, for 500 megahertz of additional spectrum, 300 megahertz in the next five years, and 200 megahertz in the next five years. I finally figured out why the FCC does everything in 10 years. It's because they can only serve eight years because they serve at the pleasure of the president. So they get a four-year term and a four-year term. So by year 10, they're gone and they don't care. Um, but anyhow, they're asking Congress to fund 16 to 12, 18 billion dollars for public safety. I'm going to talk about more that more. Um, they want 20 to 25 billion for broadband for all. Um, there's a lot of things going on. Um, but let's talk about providing broadband to more people. It's not about technology. It's not about building new networks. It's about economics. Remember I said there were two types, the people who couldn't afford it and the people who can't get it. So in different places, in cities, we have to figure out how to help people who can't afford it get broadband. In rural areas, we have to figure out how to get people broadband who can't have it. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, and we need to build on our existing resources. So rural build out, there's no economic model for it. 
There's not a wireless network operator in the world that's going to build out a county with a population of 10 people per square mile. It doesn't figure. It doesn't work. And I'll talk in a minute about how that can work. So we have plenty of technology. We just don't have any models there. OK. Um, and it's a lot of different solutions, but I'm going to talk about one that I've been working with. Um, one of the ways we can do this is, if you remember at the beginning, 96% of all of us have voice coverage, and only 92% of us have broadband coverage. So it makes sense to me to take that 92% up to 96% using the existing voice networks and enhancing them. Another solution, and I've done this in several rural communities, where we go into a school or a library that already has broadband. We put up a 50-foot tower. We put in a radio. We give the kids all PC card modems. Within a 10-mile radius of school, all of a sudden, they all have broadband. Total cost for the system, $30,000. And it works. And it works well. Um, so urban is different. I don't have a solution. I don't know how you provide money and service and devices for people in the uh, urban areas, but I think we need to figure out how to do it. Um, some places are using access centers, libraries, teen centers, and adult living, which works very well. Um, so this is all the, um, all the different methods of broadband access that we have. And by um, 2012, well, every city in this country will have 12 to 14 wired and wireless providers. This is why I don't think these can survive. Broadband pricing, somewhere between $20 and $60 a month. Um, we have to figure out how to do it. Now, I'm going to take a couple of minutes here. I have volunteered 50% of my life for the last three years to this cause. And I want to talk to you about it because it's vitally important. You have in your smartphone three times the capability that police, fire, and EMS have on their belt. They have no data. And if they're using commercial networks, the commercial networks get overloaded and they can't get through. So for three years, we've been working on getting them additional spectrum. Most communications between fire and police and EMS is done with multiple radios. The average police car has $10,000 worth of radio equipment in it. The average fire truck has $10,000 worth of radio equipment in it. And you paid $199 for your iPhone that does five times more. So the federal government gave public safety 10 megahertz of very, very valuable spectrum nationwide. However, it turns out that that 10 megahertz of spectrum is not enough. It won't handle the traffic that police, fire, and EMS need. So what we've been trying to do, there's an adjacent piece of spectrum called the D-block. And you see I got my D-block pin on here that is right next to it. That's another 10 megahertz. So we're trying to get people to reallocate the D-block to public safety and then to fund the federal, with federal money, a nationwide interoperable broadband network for public safety to the tune of 10 to $15 billion from future auctions. And any of you who think, oh my god, we've got to pay off the national debt, let me give you another point of information. Our national debt grows $4 billion a day. We're talking about four days worth of national debt to build a nationwide system for public safety. Now, 18 months ago, we couldn't have gotten a bill entered into Congress. Last week when I was in DC, there are now three bills. This week there'll be two more. And President Obama in Michigan stood up and said, we're going to reallocate the D block to public safety and we're going to fund it. The reason I'm bringing this up, we still have to get it through Congress. So I'm asking any of you who care to get a hold of your Congress people and say, Let's go ahead with one of these bills. Let's support public safety and get the uh, public safety community the funding and the spectrum they need. And I'm sorry I got off on a tangent, but like I said, I've been donating 50% of my time for the last three years to this. Uh, I think it is a very, very worthy cause. 
or I wouldn't be doing it. And very frankly, when I started out my career, I was working in public safety communications and it's been very good to me over the years. So some final comments. Wireless broadband is too successful. That's the bottom line. There's too many things that people want to do with wireless broadband. We got to figure out a way to make it better. The network, networks are scrambling to keep up with demand. I've already shown you that building cell sites is a long process in Dayton, Ohio, or Santa Barbara. It doesn't matter. It's a long process. Um, they're upgrading the networks as fast as they can to higher speed and better capacity. Remember I said there is no more spectrum. We can't build anymore. But with every technology, we're using the spectrum more efficiently. We're now transmitting data at 15 megabits or 10 megabits per second that five years ago it was impossible to do with brand new technologies. Um, look for um, different ways that they're going to manage the networks. They don't have any choice. New data pricing models, tiered pricing, and pay for large files, and I talked about that. Applications and devices, um, internet view of browsers, I talked about that. Downloading, streaming, video generates a lot more data. Um, it's incredible how much downloading there is. Um, the iPad actually and tablets could be the choking point for wireless internet. I have an iPad and I use the heck out of it. A lot of times through Wi-Fi in my home, but when I'm traveling, I use it um, on the road a lot for a lot of things. I don't watch videos, but I do a lot of reading. Um, mobile internet devices are gone, uh, more 3G notebooks. Um, there are more and more notebooks available today with built-in wide area wireless and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And think about this for a minute. I, I mentioned this BlackBerry. This BlackBerry, you've got to wonder what the engineers are doing. This BlackBerry has five wide area wireless frequencies in it because it takes me worldwide. It has a GPS receiver in it. It has Wi-Fi in it. And it has Bluetooth in it. If you counted, that's nine antennas in this device, plus the radios, and it lasts two days. It's amazing, the technology, but we're going to get to a point where we run out of that technology. New app stores, the problem, if any of you are familiar with it, is how do you find the apps you really want? I think we're going to solve that problem maybe this year. Uh, pricing models will change. I talked about that. We're going to carry multiple devices, all of us. Um, wireless penetration will go to 300% in five to 10 years. We're going to use wireless for our command and control device. Um, I'm working with an auto agency in, in a company in Detroit right now that when you get into your car, will recognize your phone. And it'll adjust your mirrors, it'll adjust your heat, it'll turn on your favorite music, it'll do all that for you. And by the way, if it's 8 o'clock in the morning, it'll recognize you're going to work, so it'll check the traffic and suggest the route. We're going to have lots more of this stuff coming for command and control. You already can check to see if your garage door is open. I have video cameras around my house. I can get to them anywhere I am in the world. Um, there's a lot more of that coming, but guess what? It all uses bandwidth. So we're going to have to figure out a, a better way. I think the FCC will find the spectrum we need. I don't think they'll find 500 megahertz, but I think they'll find a lot. And I think we're going to get some of the government spectrum added into what we already have to make this happen. It still won't be enough to match the increased demand going forward, and that's what concerns me. But um, I think there'll be some other things too. So no matter how much spectrum we have nor how good the technology, unless we manage the networks properly, none of us are going to have access to the wireless internet. So there are a lot of exciting things. This is a great industry. A lot of people are doing a lot of hard work. A lot of people are making money. Um, and I think the wireless internet and the wired internet are going to diverge when it comes to applications and types of things. Um, and I think that's where I'm going to stop. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. OK, I'd like to invite our panelists to please join us up front. 
We're going to do a, a quick intro of each panelist. And Dr. Blumenthal is going to give us uh, a few slides. Yeah, uh, Jay, Bob, Dan, please come join us. And then after uh, the intros and w after each panelist tells us a little bit about their thoughts on the subject matter, we will, uh, we will open it up to questions. I've got a few to start us off. Okay, so Dr. Daniel, Daniel J. Blumenthal is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of California. He's right here to my left. Raise your hand. Uh, Dr. Blumenthal is the director of the recently formed Terabit Optical Ethernet Center. So it's not your everyday knock. And the LASER project at UCSB, a project funded by the DARPA MTO data in the Optical Domain Network program. <laughs> Sounds very advanced. He currently serves on the board of directors for National Lambda Rail and serves on the Internet 2 Architecture Advisory Council. And he's the co-founder of Calient Networks and more recently Packet Photonics. And his interests are in optical communications, photonic packet switching and all optical networks, all optical wavelength conversion and regeneration. So please join, please welcome uh, Dr. Blumenthal. He's going to share with us a few slides for a couple minutes. Thank you. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. I didn't know our mayor was going to be here, so I want to do a quick 30 seconds here. Um, a very close friend of mine is Vice President of Verizon, and he's the one who's responsible for Fios. It was his baby. And I go there a lot, and we were just there over Christmas, and I said to him, why don't we have Fios in Santa Barbara? And he said, you could. <laughs> and as you're going to see, many of you may not know, but we at UCSB have one of the world's leading fiber optic research programs in the world. And we don't have Fios here. Now, to make you feel a little better, Stu, who lives a 10 miles from corporate headquarters, doesn't have Fios either. So it's a great mystery why you might not have Fios, whether you're the one who rolled it out or whether you're doing research in state of the art. And that's an interesting thing to talk about at some point. Um, I would like to talk today maybe about what's driving uh, this bandwidth, terabit optical ethernet. Terabit optical ethernet, that's terabits per second. That's every second that I'm talking. One times 10 to the 12th bits of information are flying past my face. On one fiber, we're planning on putting all the data that transports on the whole planet today on one fiber, just to give you an idea of what's going on at UCSB. Um, what I'd like to do is just let you know, as Andy said, video. This is Gary Epps at Cisco. This is a data center. This is a state-of-the-art data center by Yahoo called the Chicken Coop Design. Now, in this slide, what I'd like to do is tie together something very interesting. Today, and I hope it comes up, most of our constraints are power. This chicken coop design is state of the art. It runs about 10 megawatts, or about the same to power a city. However, the cost of powering it is so much money that Yahoo put it up at Niagara Falls, oriented it towards prevailing winds, uh, did like a chicken coop with louvers so that when it starts overheating, it opens it up and lets the wind cool it down, just like they used to cool chickens, and that's why you have a chicken coop. Um, Intel is a strong supporter of ours. Today, 50 billion devices are out there. Only less than 1% are connected to the internet. That will be changing very soon, and they're predicting hundreds of billions of devices connected to the internet over the next five years. As a matter of fact, UCSB is instrumental in helping Intel with a new product called um, Lightwire. They are planning on putting 100 gigabits a second to your laptop in five years with a fiber. For those of you that thought that things weren't going to go faster, get ready, because they're about to take off big time. Really quickly, storage is outstripping the network's capacity in huge ways. And you guys can get these slides offline. I'll give them to, uh, to Jock. Uh, the network has changed. Google has changed the way things work. The top is the money that the carriers make off shipping bits. They're going to zero. The bottom is the money that Google makes off advertising. The whole world has turned upside down. And if you look at Comcast, even Comcast's whole business model has completely changed in 2009. Again, I'll, I'm going through these quickly. So this is what today's network looks like. Very different than before. Very different than the old telecom world. What I want to point out here is Amazon, of all places, is building one of the biggest cloud computing networks in the world. 10 to the 24th bytes, Yottabyte network. 
of interconnected data centers. And so to address this problem, just quickly to let you know, here at UCSB is a huge jewel. The terabit optical ethernet center was founded by Google, Verizon, Intel, Agilent, and Rockwell Collins. And um, just to show you where it fits into UCSB, it's part of the Energy Efficiency Institute. Um, we have our founding industrial affiliates, and you can learn about more of this by going online or coming to us. Um, what we will be doing is making integrated chips. You open up your computers or your boards and they move electrons around. Um, we do it with moving photons around on chips and we believe that that's the way that's gonna get us to the future. These are chips that are made here by UCSB, some world record holders um, in our groups here at UCSB. And I just wanna say that it's becoming common knowledge that the kind of chips that are being made here at UCSB will get us a terabit ethernet, save us a huge amount of power, and I think that's a good launch point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dan really uh, spanned by a couple of things quickly, and I hope we, we get to it in our discussions, but photonics, which is a, a word that I learned after reading some, thing, some things about Dan, is fascinating, and it may actually be one of the solutions to the problems uh, that we're going to have with this bandwidth use. I'd like to introduce Jay Hennigan, who is to Andy's right. Please raise your hand, Jay. He's the Director of Network Engineering at Impulse Communications a local ISP here in town. And he's been with the company since its inception. In the early days, he was an engineer with the City of Santa Barbara Electronic Maintenance Group, where he implemented the city's original mobile data network for the police department, as well as maintaining and upgrading an E911 center. He's also Cisco certified with a board knowledge of TCPIP networks, traditional tele telephony, and wireless technologies. He holds FCC, radio telephone first class, and amateur extra licenses. Please welcome Jay Hennigan. So Jay, if, if you could uh, kind of uh, synthesize so far what we've been talking about with your take and some, some top right. level thoughts. Yeah. Uh, imminent death of the net predicted, and no film <laughs> at 11 because we won't have the bandwidth for it. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I, I share some of Andrew's concerns. Um, I disagree with him on a number of, uh, of points. Uh, I am a strong proponent of net neutrality I don't want to see us go back to a walled garden type situation where you've got your AOL users that can't talk to your Prodigy users, who can't talk to your CompuServe users. Um, so I, I feel that net, net neutrality is a good thing. Um, I think that a lot of uh, the way things are happening in terms of bandwidth, there's, you know, you talk about this huge revenue that the, that the wireless carriers are, are losing because they, they're getting these gigabytes of, of videos there's a streaming, but they charge you 20 cents to send a 140 character text message, and they get it. So there's, a lot of this is upside down in terms of, of uh, the way things are, are happening. I feel that uh, one of the ways that the bandwidth is going to be available as things are moving more towards the edge. Uh, we're seeing Akamai technology, uh, we have that in our data centers, where a lot of the content, a lot of the video content, a lot of the ad, web ads and what have you that you see are stored locally right here at, at our ISP. So when you visit a website that has an embedded video, CNN, Apple, uh, what have you, when you get your uh, Microsoft updates on uh, Update Tuesday, um, that's not coming across the internet. That's already been delivered to the internet and it's sitting in our data center and we serve it to you over the local pipes. So I think you're gonna see a lot of this going to the edge. Uh, same thing's true of Netflix. They are bringing huge trucks full of uh, terabyte drives that sit outside the major data center so that this does not need to traverse the uh, entire uh, internet. So you're seeing a lot of these things being distributed at the edge. Uh, Andrew is certainly right. We cannot build more spectrum. What we have is what there is available. It's the laws of physics. Uh, and what we've been doing is, is cutting away at some of the spectrum that was previously out there that we have not used. There used to be 83 6 megahertz television channels. The original cellular telephone took the first 15 of those, the top 15 of those away that weren't being used. We didn't need 83 television channels. A lot of what was wireless is now wired in terms of cable television. 
um, or has gone way up in the spectrum in terms of satellite television. Uh, so we've got all this spectrum that, that we're not using. Uh, a, a television broadcast station, single television broadcast station in Los Angeles covering a 100 mile radius or more um, uses six megahertz of spectrum to saturate that entire thing and you know, not all that many people are watching it off the air. So I think that reallocation of the existing spectrum is a good thing that will solve a lot of these problems. Thank you very much, Jay. And for those of you that, that don't know what net neutrality is, it's actually, a, I guess it's a belief system that everyone should have the equal amount of bandwidth and access to the internet, that it should not be governed, it shouldn't be managed, and maybe not even metered. So it's a, it's a philosophical shift, and I'm sure I'm going to get the clarification yeah. on those. I, I do want to in, uh, introduce Bob Fasulki, Vice President of Engineering with Digital West Networks. Bob's been in this industry for more than 30 years, and he's designed and implemented all forms of telecommunications technologies, spanning from RF to optics. And he's actually been involved in some pretty uh, exciting international leadership projects, including implementing voice and data networks in Rwanda, Africa. And uh, he's also had some uh, implementation projects in Ireland. Um, he's w implemented one of the first networks that carries HTTV on multicast IP packets for large-scale deployments. So please welcome Bob Fasulki. Thank you. So what are your, uh, what are your thoughts on, on what we're talking about here? Well, the net neutrality thing, as you can see, is obviously very controversial, even within the, uh, those of us that are in the technology space, and I have my opinion as well, but uh, probably could do another whole meeting on that. I just wanted to characterize things a little bit, though. Um, what you're hearing here, you could in some ways take as being a little bit hysteric or a little bit overstated, but let me, let me assure you that none of what you've heard tonight is, is an exaggeration, and I'll, I'll give you a case in point. Um, I had the privilege of actually working for some of the people that invented the internet. I know some of those folks personally. They, the, the first release of the internet was based on a thing called version 4. You'll hear people say IPv4. Um, when the guys all got together and they invented that, IPv4 provided enough addresses for what we thought was just an insane amount of things. Um, almost 20 addresses per person on the planet. 20 persons. As of last month, we ran out of addresses. There are no more IPv4 addresses available at the top level tiers. So what's just left is what's in the pipe from here on down. This is a really big deal. Nevertheless, these guys were so smart, I had the greatest amount of respect for them, that about uh, 10 or 12 years ago, my brain kind of loses me. They went back and they said, well, you know, let's, we did pretty good the first time around. Let's see what we can do the second time around. So now you'll hear about a thing called IPv6. Some of you will think, well, it's just a lot more addressing space. It is. It's on the order of a million addresses per square meter on the Earth. There's address space that's been assigned to the planets. So it's, these guys really went back and thought it through in a completely different way. With, with the IPv6 scheme, though, there's actually quite a few other things that are embedded in there. There's a little thing called extensions. And one of the things that you, you'll hear they're talking about, everything being IP-based, IPv4 is actually a pretty dumb technology. It's, you know, it's what we call a session state or a link state technology. It knows it wants to go from here to here. V6 is going to be smart enough to actually know who you're doing, what, I mean, what you're doing, where you're going, all these ty types of things you're talking about. So we have these, uh, I think there's 21 defined extensions in there right now that are virtually not being used. I had a chance to talk to uh, the chief engineer of Verizon a few weeks ago. They're really thinking through how they're going to go about putting and using those extensions. So some of these things you see talking about here today and then things that we haven't even begun to think about will start to emerge. It'll be a completely different network in just the next five years. Thank you, Thank you very much, Bob. Okay, I'd like to start us off with a few questions and then open it up to the floor. So to what degree can we address these capacity issues with software and re-engineering of software systems and the, the way the networks are architected alone? without actually having to make physical fiber and you know, physical hardware changes? That's probably a good one for you. Um, I guess a good example is this right here. It's already done. Um, many people might not know that AT&T on your uh, iPhone puts what's called a flow control uh, software in here. And when you get onto the edge network, the 3G network, it's actually limiting the bit rate per second that you can flow. When you go and connect to your Wi-Fi, this thing is smart enough that it opens the floodgate up. So you'll notice that when you're talking on 3G or Wi-Fi, pages load at different speeds, and that's because of flow control in this device. 
That has to do with the way that uh, Verizon, uh, AT&T communicates with this phone. Verizon has a different communication structure that's not as limited. And what's interesting is you can go down the street and buy a little box that is a Wi-Fi box that talks to the Verizon on 3G, talks to Wi-Fi to your AT&T devices, up to five of them, and fools this device into thinking it's on Wi-Fi when it's really over a 3G network and opens the floodgates up. So um, it's interesting because you can actually fool them too. But uh, flow control is one of the band aids in addition to the other things that Andy talked about that yeah. are already doing that with software. Yeah. And Jay, could you talk a little bit more about the edge? That kind of right. Well, I was going to address your previous question. So what we're seeing is uh, flow control, or what is, might be called quality of service. Um, and this relates to um, what Vint Cerf uh, jokingly had on a t-shirt once that said IP on everything, in that all applications will eventually become uh, IP. And one of the things that we do on our network um, is voice over internet. So real-time voice um, is essentially taking a phone call, cutting it into 50 packets per second, sending those packets out the internet, and then reassembling them into speech at the other end. Um, and so flow control and quality of service is very important for voice. If those packets come in the wrong order, if I delay a syllable of speech a half a second, I certainly don't want to then throw it back in the data stream because it'll just wind up sounding like garbage. Um, whereas streaming video, if I can delay when I click on demand to go watch a Netflix video and I delay that for 50 seconds so that I've got a buffer of, of data, then if I lose a few packets or something comes out of order, I've got a 50-second buffer window to, to rearrange that. So I think one of the things you're going to see in software is prioritization of traffic. Real-time voice traffic um, needs to get there right away. If I lose a 50th of a second of speech, it's not a big deal. Um, but it, I have to get them in the right order without appreciable delay. Um, a text file, a program, a, a something that is software, um, has to be 100% correct. An email, um, you know, or, or the text document, software code, uh, you want to make certain that that is error free. So you use TCP, which is a connection oriented, what they call reliable protocol, to make certain that everything has a checksum and everything works out 100%. But if that's delayed a little bit, it doesn't matter. So we've addressed this to some extent. IPv6 obviously is, is, has uh, some security measures, uh, encryption built into it as well. But uh, applications that uh, traverse the network based upon the uh, characteristics of that application and having the network adapt to those characteristics is, is very important. I think that's something that needs to be addressed uh, network-wide. Yeah, and Andy, you had shared an example that sounds a lot like that about that calendar entry. Yeah, um, but uh, the point I wanted to make here was that um, LTE, the fourth generation technology, has four levels of quality of service built in, and it has seven priority levels built in. It also has more network management capability than any other wireless protocol we've ever seen. And, you know, what's really interesting to me is Verizon, AT&T are going to roll this out, but it's going to take them literally a year or more to learn how to manage these networks because there are so many parameters within them, but they are going to be doing flow control, they're going to be doing quality of service, and the way the customer is going to see quality of service is how much are you willing to pay for how much data speed you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's specifically though, as, as an example that, that's been alluded by everybody here, is, is applications that are smarter, that are actually right. going out to the internet, retrieving data, as opposed to the user launching a browser on their phone or on their desktop. Right. And Andy, you had talked about an example where, you know, if you've got a flight to Dallas, what kind of information could the app get for you? Yeah, well, I mean, what's really funny is one of my business partners wrote this thing in 1999 and called it active content, okay? And we're still looking. There are companies like WorldMate Live and people like that that are doing this. But the bottom line is that you embed something in a calendar and then there are a lot of actions that take part. And, and the whole description is, so I have a flight to Dallas, I have a hotel reservation, so 
the flight is constantly updated. There's a weather icon that's placed on my calendar. They know that I'm, the calendar knows I'm going to rent a car from Hertz. It knows I'm going to a certain hotel. So when I get there, the turn-by-turn -turn directions have already been downloaded. Um, it knows that I like Chinese food and I have four hours of time that night. So it identifies the nearest Chinese food restaurant. The next morning when I'm going to call on my customer, it lists all those customer orders for me. And by the way, it reminds me of his wife's and kids' names and that he's a golfer. I mean, all of that's done without ever touching a browser. Yeah. That sounds like way beyond any bandwidth issue. It sounds like being proactive and almost telepathic. <laughs> <laughs> Are we getting to the point, gentlemen, where every individual is going to be metered? Where you know my usage in a given month might be $27, and the next month it might be $55, and then $300 the next month? I mean, is that where we're headed to really control and manage this network? Let me ask you a question. That's the way you pay for your water, and that's the way you pay for your electricity. True. But that's not how I pay for cable or satellite. I mean, is that where the Internet is headed? Well, wait, you've got to make a distinction between the wireless Internet and the Internet, okay? The wireless Internet is going to be price constrained because that's the most effective way of managing bandwidth. All right, what happens on the wired Internet is up for discussion. Okay. But you can have a hybrid where you have mobility uh, such as your local Wi-Fi um, that is tied back to wired internet. And when you think about it, the cellular network, the backhaul, is all wired. Uh, some of it might be microwave, but it's, it's essentially a fixed point-to-point -point network. It's not point-to-multipoint wireless. So again, we're back to the edge in that the wireless internet is really the edge from that cell tower to your individual device. Mm -hmm. That could very easily be wired internet to a Wi-Fi hotspot to your device as well. So I didn't get a definitive answer to the question. I mean, is, are, we, are we always, and it may be this, the answer I should ask in a different way, uh, is unlimited bandwidth a thing of the past? For wireless, my answer is yes. Doctor? <laughs> Dan. Dan? <laughs> um, I agree with Andy. For wired, I think it's undetermined yet. There's huge pressure from the carriers to want to classify in the filters and routers uh, different clients that are willing to pay for different uh, performance. So they're looking for like even cost billable uh, queues inside the packet routers that sit in the core of the internet. And um, I think the world's not that simple because there's a huge backlash on that kind of behavior. I mean, you know, in the end, I mean, we're the customers, and I don't think that people will put up with that. So my own personal opinion is that no, that won't happen. They'll will be continued to be fooled. There will be points in the network that will meter out um, the flow control. Like right now, for example, I think one way to say this that might reach everybody is you can't get an end-to-end -end what's called service level agreement today. You, you don't get it. And I can't state how fundamental that is. Your service level agreement, when you sign up for DSL, is only from your house to the nearest router, period. That's the only contractual obligation they have. You're never going to get that all the way to where you want to go for your data. Now, if you think about how profound that is, um, what it's saying, just like with Cox, is that they're going to put a meter controller there, and they're going to let the economics scale at that point, and that's all they're going to guarantee you. And there are some people who say we're never going to see really good end-to-end -end performance if we don't get end-to-end -end service level agreements. Um, and one school of thought is to argue that you're going to have to charge people what you're saying in order to get that. Another school of thought is that the carriers are just going to have to pay for the infrastructure upgrade to give it, because otherwise we're going to stall all the applications, which are the real money makers. So I think that's what it's, what it's going to come down to. Yeah. The, the important thing is this end-to-end -end concept <clears throat> Is, is really important. Uh, Andy made the point early on that uh, the carriers all have these informal agreements. The one thing that's not written down anywhere, if I say my packet coming from my phone is more important than your packet going from your phone, as soon as I hit that common point that uh, Dan's referring to, all bets are off. I mean, so it's, it's really a myth to think that we're gonna use prioritization unless you can control your own network. And the fact that the wired world and the Un, uh, and the wireless world are two different things. So let me give you the case. In my network, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a deep fiber provider. I only have fiber customers. So everybody in my network has got the luxury of a full gigabit of opt optical connectivity to their site. 
I don't care what they use. Uh, go for it. Um, have have fun. Mm -hmm. But you don't have that option to take them to some random ISP off, off net. Off net. And I have right. the same problem once I transfer and, off and, my network. And the, the concept that he's talking about is service level agreements are generally on net. So what we've done at Impulse, for example, is we have multiple backbone providers. So rather than being a quote unquote tier one network that only has our own network and can only guarantee within our customers, right. we buy transit and we pay for service level agreements from multiple national backbones. So now, if there is an issue, odds are that our customer is trying to talk to someone who is a customer of one of those major backbones and now I've got a throat to choke. I can go to my carrier and say, our service level agreement says that from our customer to this point in your network, you're supposed to give this, go fix it. Mm -hmm. um, the internet as, as a whole, and this relates to the net neutrality situation, and that has always been the case, that every carrier can only guarantee service level to within their network. And within the, the internet itself is a network of networks. Nobody owns it, nobody regulates it. That is a double-edged sword. There's no guarantee. It's always been best effort. But on the other hand, you know, there's no, there's no big brother. Um, and so if you don't like what you've got, you go somewhere else. Right. I'd like to open up for questions. Yes, sir. And I'm going to repeat the question so that the yeah. viewers at home can participate. Oh, I guess not. Well, we're good. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Henry Baker. I'm a... Uh, MIT electrical engineer and computer scientist, and a uh, partner in a <clears throat> $1.5 billion private equity fund uh, investing in uh, infrastructure communications, including we were the first uh, institutional investor in Nakamai. Um, I have to vehemently disagree with uh, Mr. Siebold's conclusions here. There is no uh, bandwidth problem. The um, Erwin uh, Jacobs showed many, many years ago, he's the founder of Qualcomm, about how you, uh, if you power limit the devices, and Bell Labs showed if you uh, steer the, the uh, signals through space, um, you can share the bandwidth among as many people as you want. There's just simply, uh, you know, the, the conclusion that you're reaching is just simply false on a technical basis. The, what's, what's missing here is the architecture. What, what we're dealing with is a legacy uh, architecture, which is, is it's a dinosaur, and it has to be replaced. And this is the whole rationale of the mesh networks, the ad hoc networks. Uh, there was a very good uh, PhD thesis from MIT back around 97, 98, which actually started this whole area. And so I, I think what's missing here is a failure of um, innovation, a failure of, of imagination. It's not a failure of the technology. Yeah, and I, I think Andy did say that there were implications like you were describing. But you know, when you're looking at that 120 degree chart that he showed in one network, and, and the other thing that I think is, is hard to deny is that when one network is saturated, there is a change in speeds and there's latency. I can but point I think Andy will probably be able to better address and maybe... I can point a laser directly at you. And not only that, I can point a laser at every single person in this room and not interfere. And in fact, those, the laser beams can actually intersect and not interfere. There is no problem. What you need is multiple, input, multiple output antenna which actually do this. There, there's, a, there's a lot of work going on in mesh networks. There's a lot of work going on in smart antennas, or Raycom. Um, and I've, I've done work for Erwin Jacobs for 25 years, and I've sat and talked to him about all of this. Um, the Obama plan was to also infuse a huge amount of money, $500 million in research for cognitive radios, for smart radios, for mesh networking, for all of the things you're talking about. But none of them are ready for prime time today. And what we're trying to do is to get some spectrum set aside so we can experiment with these and play with them. And um, there's an awful lot of very good things, but there's also the downside. He mentioned a minute ago that wireless is 
only, you know, it used to be the last mile, last quarter mile, last 10 feet, but that's all it is. Everything else is wired. And it's like Eric Schmidt at Google, he said, there is no bandwidth problem. We just build things closer and closer together. Well, my answer to him on the panel was that's because you own all the fiber. Okay, I mean. Every fiber is capable of upwards of 20 terabits today. So there is there's, there's no bad news problem. Well, but you've got to get the fiber in the ground, and that's the big issue. Yeah. Jay, you had some thoughts yeah, on this? Well, getting back to the, to the question that you raised earlier is, are we at the end of unlimited, unmetered um, bandwidth or uh, download capability, and are we going to start seeing pay for as you go, as they do for water and we do for electricity? Um, way back when, I used to sell cellular telephones analog cellular telephones. And the typical rate there was $45 a month and you got uh, 200 minutes and it was 45 cents per minute for voice after your 200 minutes plus long distance at 25 cents a minute. And it used to cost, you know, 25, 30 cents on AT&T to call across the country. A domestic long distance voice minute today is not worth billing. So this is, I think, what we're seeing in the voice world, I think, is what we're going to start seeing in the data world. Because I, I do not think we are at the end of, of unmetered bandwidth. Not yet. Not yet. Dan? Um, if, if everybody could humor me for just a minute, I'd like to illustrate a point. Um, just for three seconds, everybody turn and have a conversation with the person three people away from you. Just all at once for three seconds. Just go ready, set, go. Hey there, how's it going? <laughs> okay, stop. Okay, stop. Did any of you understand what anybody was saying? Probably not. The bandwidth of the medium that we have right now relative to our vocal cords is pretty unlimited. But that's not the point. And I hate to disagree because I do research in pushing us towards that 20 terahertz of bandwidth from the fiber. It's not about the capacity. It's about what's now called good put. Latency, um, throughput, good put, how useful is the data relative to the application. Bandwidth is actually really not the issue here, and I think that I'd like to throw out there the fact that you guys just experienced for the first time that when you want to communicate, you don't have a laser pointer per person because it costs too much money. What you do is you build a network. Once you start building a network, now you have to mediate how people get onto it. It's called MAC protocols. Then you have to start working with all the layers of applications that deal with all of the things we need, and that's the point, is let's stop talking about bandwidth. Because yes, there may be a lot of bandwidth out there, but in terms of running real applications and making money, having it scale, getting it out to people there, I think the discussion needs to turn around to other aspects. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Henry. Appreciate that. Other questions? Matt, uh, wait for the mic. It's coming over. Hi, my name is uh, Matt Mason. I'm a computer scientist and also with PlanetSantaBarbara.com. A question: uh, Has anybody, or have you guys, had any exposure to anybody who's working on some of the lazier protocols uh, as perhaps a way of getting around this? You know, everybody talks about TCP/IP, but nobody hears about UDP anymore. And um, you know, kind of crappy is okay for most of the stuff that most people are doing. And so then. You know, when it gets there, it doesn't really matter. If I send an email to a colleague, it may not be important to, that they get it for 20 minutes. And so TCP IP is not so an, such an important protocol, and maybe UDP is the best way or some other lazy or kind of crappy way of communicating. Well, all of that streaming video and voice over IP is UDP um, because uh, it, you don't care about the connection state. You're just going to stream that, and, and, and a little bit of loss is okay. Um, so there are different media for different, for different things. If you're doing a financial transaction with your bank, you don't want to drop a zero in the middle of, a, <laughs> of, a, of an amount. So you use TCP as a reliable connection-oriented protocol to make certain that the data is received and received correctly with checksums, and I didn't get that packet, send it again. I got that packet, was corrupted, send it again. <clears throat> with something like streaming video, you don't care. If, the, if a few pixels disappear in the middle of a chase scene, why, it's not worth resending. 
So the UDP is, I would say, growing as a percentage of the uh, internet traffic, particularly with what, uh, what, what, what Andrew is saying with, with streaming video. Next question. I saw Steve's hand first. Hi, my name is uh, Steve Nellis with the Pacific Coast Business Times. And I, have a, I don't want to drag this back to net neutrality too much, but I, I do want to ask if there could be a different, if there could be some sort of policy that differentiated among concepts, sort of the way you would differentiate between free speech and free beer. Whereas, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, could there be some framework in which there was a, a sort of, you know, agnostic, a data agnostic way just to meter on some sort of purely quantitative scale without uh, prejudice, you know, prejudicing against where the traffic is coming, coming from or, or going to. So, you know, kind of the way you have free speech, but that doesn't mean that you can just copy, you know, go and take a book and photocopy it and start selling copies, uh, even though you are allowed to talk about it and things like that. The, the court case that started the whole net neutrality issue in uh, the FCC, and by the way, the Republicans have their belief about it and the Democrats have their belief, but there was a court case for a New York City cable company that shut down a young man who was running five servers out of his apartment. And he was using all the available bandwidth for that whole building. So they shut him down. The FCC came along and said, you are not allowed to shut him down. You must let him operate. So the lawsuit ensued, and that's what the present buzz is about net neutrality is does Time Warner Cable, does Cox Cable, does Verizon Wireless, does AT&T have the right to take somebody who is hogging the entire amount of bandwidth in a given area and throttle them back or shut them down so that the rest of the customers have access? And was, that a, was that a wired environment? That was a, a cable TV, a cable modem environment. And remember, cable modem is shared, all right? It's not like DSL. Everything's shared okay. at some point, but cable is shared on a community basis or a block or an apartment basis. So I think the short answer to your question is there is the ability to do what we call rate shaping, but in a common environment like that, I can't do that on a per subscriber basis. So it just isn't technologically there. With, again, without adding some more intelligence potentially to a modem, um, that requires a whole bunch more regulatory approval. And really, a lot of the things we've got ourselves talking about right at the moment are really, they're more political than they are technologically. Um, you're entirely right. There's adequate space for all of this stuff. Most of it gets disconced in the, in the political debate, who's allocating space, how many point to multi-point environments, that kind of thing, so. Yeah. Yep. I think there are some techn technological um, uh, solutions to that. Um, weighted fair queuing is, is a, a very old uh, elementary quality of service protocol that basically says I've got all these streams, um, even though this one is much larger than the other ones, this one person who's trying to hog all the bandwidth, um, I'm going to, you know, intersperse this other traffic in between uh, in between that. Um, I also think the cable company, you know, by promising something that, that they weren't able to deliver in that particular case, and I'm not familiar with the exact specifics of that case, net neutrality, um, as far as my understanding of it, is that uh, content from a particular provider or a, a, uh, cannot be suppressed over that of another. Um, so I think there's different, different definitions of net neutrality depending, again, upon your political viewpoint. There's um, two interesting issues, I think, tied here. One is the issue of rate shaping. Often happens is what's called the edge routers. Um, a lot of um, ad drop multiplexers, edge routers, like 10,000 users will come in, and then you'll shape the traffic so that when it goes through the core, the core is a lot better behaved. And that tends to get rid of a lot of the hogging of bandwidth back at the queues of these rate shapers. The other thing that runs into problems is there's denial of service attacks. And it's very difficult to differentiate between a denial of service attack and someone just plain old hogging the bandwidth. 
So all of a sudden you run into issues of protecting the network itself from being crashed down versus the right for people just to use as much bandwidth as they want. So I agree that policy is going to be the number one thing that really drives a lot of this because um, we can go off in, this, in many directions and always come to the conclusion that probably policy is going to be the limitation. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So in that particular court case, it's almost like the other uh, homeowners, the other apartment dwellers could have gone after that one individual for taking away their network. I think if they knew who it was, they probably would have. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, somebody figured out who it was, right? Yeah. yeah, the cable company. There's a question right here in the center. Uh, the mic's on its way. While well, he's bringing the mic over, we always know who you are. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a converse to this court argument as well. You're saying that because somebody hooked up five routers and sucked up all the bandwidth, that all of a sudden the bandwidth is all gone and there's a court issue. What if I'm Netflix and you know I'm higher up in the food chain and I decide that I want to hog up all the bandwidth by pushing all this information out to people who want to look at whatever crappy movies it is that I want to sell to them. Now all of a sudden that takes precedence over some guy who wants to check the balance on his checking account or make a phone call or read an email, something to that effect. In many respects I agree with the first gentleman who spoke this evening talking about there isn't really a constraint on bandwidth, but perhaps it's a matter of how we're looking at how things should be used. You also mentioned something about making sure that we should do some things to help people who are in rural environments and to find ways to get internet access to people who currently do not have it. I'd like to hear more from the panel about that because we've been focused on how to make all this stuff work but we don't seem to be doing anything in the national interest. You know, when we created a national highway system, that was in the national interest. In the late 1940s, when the FCC came together and figured out how to allocate the spectrum at that time for television, that was done in the national interest. It seems as though what we're doing now is in the interest of Verizon and AT&T and Sprint and T-Mobile. Speak about the national interest and how we're able to level things so that everybody can get into this. Okay, I, don't, I don't want to take a lot of time, but part of what we're doing with the public safety broadband is in rural America, we're not going to need all 20 megahertz of it all the time. So we've already talked to the rural co-ops, the rural carriers, uh, the medical people, the libraries, and the educational facilities, and we put together a consortium that is a private-public partnership. And it means the networks get built out faster they get built out with federal money from public safety. They get built out with in-kind from the power companies who own rights-of-ways, they own backhaul, they own tower structures. And the end result is that we cover 98% of rural America for public safety and for the power companies and for the power companies' users within five years. That's the plan that is, is on the books right now. So something funny happened last year, I think, that address is your issue. Um, many people know it, maybe they don't. Um, Google um, became very close to the FCC. Now let's um, say that uh, Verizon and AT&T and these guys, they're not bad guys. They're just businesses that are trying to balance infrastructure costs with user revenue, which is going down over time. Well, okay, you know, there's fiber going to the home, limited rates, there's just all kinds of stuff going on. Google's thinking, well, no, wait a second. I'm trying to sell applications. If these guys don't get their acting gear, I'm not gonna be able to sell my applications. So when you look under the hood, it's not a big mystery why Google was in there with Obama and the FCC to implement exactly what you said. We do now have the jobs program across states. Remember the 100 gig megabits to every home in the United States? There's the Google uh, Fiber to the Home Initiative run by Cedric Lamb at Google. Um, and the uh, money was given by the feds to make that project hit the inner cities where the populations were the densest. So what Google did is it said, I gotta get my applications out there if I'm gonna keep growing. The carriers have their hands tied by many parameters. I'm gonna do an end run. I'm gonna go to the FCC. I'm gonna get money from the Obama administration for us to buy a lot of fiber and now have an FTTH project. 
Let me guarantee you that Google does not want to be in the FTTH business or the fiber business or anything to do with any of that. They just want to sell applications. So this is essentially a kick in the butt by Google with the Obama administration and the FCC to unclog the whole system through a jobs program. So fortunately, that has already happened. And Google has grants. I think Santa Barbara submitted one to uh, Google. Um, we weren't chosen because we are not dense enough population. And so I think that's the good news, is that it actually is happening. That's what I call the Google net. Well, but there are, for example, Google with their applications. So we are an internet service provider. We have our customers who are primarily looking to receive content. Some of them are, are sending content, but most of them are looking to receive content. So I can get Google by going to one of my transit carriers, AT&T, Sprint, Level 3, Global Crossing, Quest, and paying them for that bandwidth to haul Google from wherever Google is to get them to my customers, and I have to pay them for that. Or if I have a point of presence in Los Angeles where Google is, I can say, hey, Google, throw me a wire. And they do that as what's called private peering. And I can now get all of the Google content I want for free uh, without having to pay a transit provider to deliver it to me on IPv4 and on IPv6, and that's what we're doing. So I think what you're going to see Google doing is a lot more of these end runs around the uh, uh, large wired networks, which saves the bandwidth on the large wired networks and is more cost effective. And I think that's what you're seeing uh, Netflix do, is they're coming into the major level three pops and they're saying, we're gonna put our equipment here. That's what you're seeing Amazon with their cloud computing, is that cloud is distributed, again, moving everything towards the edge and relieving the congestion on the major backbones. There, there's some interesting things going in, on in Europe that are worth following. Um, nothing has happened legally yet, but there is a proposal in France, Germany, and the UK that the people who generate the most traffic across the network pay the network operator for generating that traffic, and that that income is only to be used to enhance the network and build it out. And that's a very interesting concept to me. You know, uh, the network providers here, of course, they, they, pay, they charge both the people who are delivering content to them and those who are receiving it. So they get it on both ends. Where does, uh, where does uh, satellite fit into all this? And especially as the gentleman had asked in rural areas, is there a, is there a viable way to, to receive and send network traffic over the satellites? There are satellite systems up there now. There are three different companies offering satellite service. Um, Sky Blue is one of them. Um, there's an issue with satellite. First of all, the satellite providers are very smart because they have a very limited uplink budget. So if you try to send a 10 megabyte PowerPoint file, they're gonna throttle your speed down. And they're gonna throttle it down to the point where you think you're on uh, 56K dial-up. Um, but the biggest problem with satellite is if you wanna do banking, you wanna do SSL or anything else, the latency on the satellite will not, I mean, if you're a farmer, you can get on the internet, you can do everything you want. But if you want to go to Bank of America and do your banking, no way, because the latency is too long for the encryption and it just drops off. Mm -hmm. So you can use some of the internet, but not all. Got it. Just to give you some sense, the, the satellite that Andy's referring to, or these are our stationary satellites that are on the order of, you know, what, 1,000 miles up? I mean, they're... 23,000 miles. 23,000 miles. <laughs> so the latency is on the order of almost a full second to go up and down. Wow. Um, about a quarter of a second. There's, there's been... Well, it depends, <laughs> on whether or not you're, it depends on whether or not you're in Africa. In Jamie, Africa, Jamie, it is sure almost wants. a full second. Um, but the, there, are, there, are some, uh, there are some projects out there um, that have been tried, some that have been failed, some of them that are being re resurrected again. I noticed that uh, the Iridium people are back into having a full launch schedule. Um, there's another company called O3B, which the name of the company, interestingly enough, is based upon the other three billion. So to answer your question specifically about uh, the rural folks uh, that are out there, uh, it's these kinds of solutions that are, AT&T, Verizon, uh, I think we've set it up here a number of times, they're never going to go to, you know, a, a, a county with 10 people per even square mile. Um, 
These low Earth orbit satellites uh, resolve an awful lot of the in issue of, uh, of latency. Um, they circle just about 100 or so miles above the Earth. Um, I say it's been tried. It's very expensive. Um, I, I don't know how the, how the model is ever going to work. Uh, I think Bill Gates and some of those other folks got involved with it about 10 years ago. The whole project's folded up. But nevertheless, there are at least two that I know of right off the top of my head that are actively back in the game. Um, the Iridiums are first supposed to go up out of Vandenberg, as a matter of fact. Some of them are scheduled to launch out of there in uh, 2014. So there is some hope. Latency, uh, let me just close by saying latency is a problem that's only going to get worse. Um, when we first started doing things on the Internet, we were pretty adverse to being even detecting latency. But if you go back, for those of you that are as old as I am, you'll remember making your first transatlantic phone calls via satellite, and you actually had to wait for the latency for the call. Hence, there is no voice traffic that goes over satellites any longer. Or you see the reporters that are off in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan on their satellite phones, and they have to wait for the uh, interviewer to finish asking their question, that kind of thing. So that's why we do things on a terrestrial nature. Um, uh, 99 point some percent of all traffic between continents flows on submarine cables only because it's the most latency lowest latency means of being able to uh, get across the continent. Latency is huge. It is, it, I, I don't know this, but I, I used Wi-Fi on my last uh, flight to New York. Mm -hmm. Was that through a satellite or some other system? Does it anybody know that one? Uh, yeah, it depends on the airline, okay. Um, and some of the satellite, some of it's through satellite. Some of it is a new band that the FCC auctioned off, which is from the airline down to ground stations. Um, which has more limited bandwidth, so without knowing what airline, it's hard to know. Um, but if you notice, um, there are some limitations to what you can do with the Wi-Fi on the airplane. Yeah, I had trouble Skyping. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Other so, questions? So. There's a gentleman here in the side. Although I, you can Skype on the train pretty good from here to San Diego. Yeah, but that, that's offloaded to terrestrial networks. Yeah. Uh, in talking about uh, penetration and uh, number of users, um, it should be remembered that uh, the Internet just brought down 2.5 hostile governments. And when I say 2.5, two entire ones and about one-tenth each for Syria, Iran, and so on. <laughs> and uh, they're about to go to 3.0 because uh, the $25 million that was allocated through the State Department for um, uh, what I think they call high availability, and what they mean is circumventing Iranian censors um, is actually a five million dollars of it is slated to go to the Falun Gong which would like to overthrow the People's Republic of China government and uh, that's pretty significant so um, you know I don't know how far they're gonna go but the Chinese are easily the best at blocking what I've never noticed in the IPv6 just because I haven't had a chance to read about it do they have any kind of attention to circumvention and non-circumvention in their protocols and flags uh, not, not really any more than with V4. In other words, you still have to go with deep packet inspection and, and uh, you know, in order to really determine what the content is of a, uh, of a packet. Um, and is that 0.5, does, uh, how, mu how much of that 0.5 do you attribute to uh, Stuxnet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so something that's, that was just in the news and someone called me and they said, you know, did you hear that they shut down the internet in Egypt? And I said, no, I didn't hear that. And I started thinking, like, how can you do that when all these are concentric integrated networks? I mean, don't you just need one way out and one way in to, to keep going? Well, again, most of the internet in Egypt is going to be over a few uh, cable connections. And you essentially go into the people at the landing point with, with uh, you know, people with machine guns and, and say, would you please pull that plug? And most of them will say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the other thing that happened in Egypt, which I found fascinating, is that the government enacted the emergency uh, alerting rule, and they sent out text messages that were pro-government. And none of the network operators wanted to do it, but they were forced to by the government. And then you think about the fact that the United States government is about to enact the same legislation in this country. You have to wonder. Mm -hmm. We've got time for one more question. Hi, I'm Bob Crisco with Integrated Transcription. I just wanted to go back to the times we talked about fiber, uh, which were in reference to Fios and to Google. 
I think you've answered most of the question or quite a bit of the question as to what is Google going to do with all that dark fiber. Uh, part A of the question, part B would be what can we do to help bring Fios to those of us who want it here? Well, let, let me try. I've, I've done two grant applications myself um, as far as the broadband grant applications as well as Google applications. So I've, I've done, been through that whole piece. I'm very familiar with what um, what Google's um, thinking and doing. Uh, it is, their most current thing is an FTTH. We think it's more a proof of concept, something more or less to, um, I don't, I don't want to say embarrass AT&T and Verizon, but when you think of AT&T and those guys talking about broadband being something that's 756K, for example, I mean, that's a pretty anemic definition. So you have to kind of kind of look at where the bar really should be set. We all know that that number is going to be obsolete. It has already been obsolete. So the whole issue of, uh, of doing things like Fios, uh, for those of you who don't know, Fios is uh, Verizon's version of doing fiber to the home. Um, U versus AT&T. U, -verse, yeah. U versus AT&T's. Um, they've, they've gone out and they've deployed these in quite a few places. But on the other hand, once the broadband grant stimulus money was made available, both of them coincidentally backed off of their plans for doing deep fiber deployments to a number nearly equal to that of the federal government's number. What that says is that. If there was a likelihood, and I don't know where San, uh, Santa Barbara stands in this, I know where San Luis Obispo stands, I'm a little bit closer to it. I don't know that you're a lot different than us in that regard. You probably have a better chance. But I know we have zero chance in San Luis Obispo that either one of those companies is going to come in. There isn't the density there. Uh, there isn't the will to do the capital builds anymore, as we've seen earlier. Um, the money just isn't in it for those guys to do those kinds of things. So bottom line is I don't think you're going to see anything like that unless you choose to do it yourself. I mean, that's, that's basically what we're doing. We just basically took our own destiny in our own hands and we're doing it on our own. Let, let me make just a couple of comments about that. In um, New Zealand, they took one city and they opened up trenches in the city and they said to fiber providers, you have six weeks to bury your fiber. And they now have their entire city covered with four fiber providers. Uh, and because the city came and filled them all in. Now, as far as Verizon, when I first moved here, they were talking about Fios at, in 2013 in this area. They have stopped building fiber. Their board has told them that they have to get more subscribers. The most interesting thing to me is that the um, Verizon can make money on fiber, buried fiber, which is the most expensive kind of fiber with a 20% uptake rate in a given city. And that's not much. The, the whole, it's a good point that he makes about in New Zealand, they took a completely different approach. That's exactly what it's gonna take. It's gonna take you, the mayor, um, you, the city, um, all getting together and just taking a completely different approach. Um, Go to, next time, in our case, I get notification from the city of San Luis Obispo every time there's a sewer project so that I can, in fact, throw my fiber in with their sewer project. There's these kinds of partnerships that are going to really be the only way that a, that, a, that a little company like us can ever even begin close to providing service to the community uh, that, they, that they live in. So Thank it's you. interesting. When I did ask uh, my friend why we didn't have uh, Fios in Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Barbarans are interesting creatures. Um, they don't like having their environment messed with. Um, and I'm in that ballpark too. So pretty much everybody here would have to agree that you don't mind having all your streets ripped up for them to come in and put fiber in. As I understand it, Verizon is very happy to put Fios in Santa Barbara. It's not clear that Santa Barbarans are willing to put up with what it would take to get Fios here. And well, I think that's part of the issue. But, but where we are undergrounding utilities, for example, they just did the Mesa, all right? Mm -hmm. And there are conduits there um, when they did all that work. Yes. So it could be done. It could be done, yeah. It'd be nice to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, this guy. Uh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. So for March, we're going to be talking about energy efficiency tomorrow and today. And it's something that actually Dan alluded to, that there is an energy problem. Please come back on March 16th. And in, in April, we're going to be talking about online personal data tracking. You can run, but you can't hide. And why would you want to anyway? And so please join us for that. Please uh, join me in thanking Dan, Bob, Jay, and Andy.
se rendre utile et passer à l'action Il suffit juste simplement de s'agiter Faire les gens qui jouent en évitant les coups qu'on se donne à soi En gesticulant sans arrêt Les mains toujours au bout des bras Brasse l'air inutilement